Hey, good morning. Uh, we're here at a little different time. <laughs> well, we just got an amen from a couple trucks out there in the parking lot. Uh, welcome to the Easter Sunday service here at Genesis Church, and we are blessed to be here at the Pro Family Farms in Donald, South Carolina. You can't see them, but our folks are here. Our kids are just leaving for Children's Church, and you got to have your pastor. And uh, I was just thinking about this message. Because be honest, I was really nervous about this message. It's Easter Sunday. It's also our first day of meeting together since November in person. And it's our first time meeting in person since we made the decision to move our um, from our rental building for safety reasons, which was a very difficult decision, very difficult. And moved out on faith and our concerns for safety. And it'd be tough to be a church family without a steady place to meet, even in COVID times. To be honest, and get inside a pastor's head, a lot of you that know me, I refer to myself more as a shepherd than a pastor. Somebody says, good to meet you, pastor, yesterday, and I turned around, even after four years, I turned around and was looking to see who they were talking about. It can be hard to be upbeat. It can be hard to be that source of support when you feel like you're a shepherd and there's no place for the flock to graze. It's harder to hear what the Holy Spirit's trying to say to you. Originally, I had planned on continuing the, ser the series, Words on the Cross. I've been felt to lead that and have that for three Sundays. But when I woke up Saturday morning with the verses laid on my heart, I knew we needed to talk about them today and as I read through the verses we're going to talk about, I start realizing what the Holy Spirit's saying to me. I don't think I'm the only one that needs to hear it today. If you have your Bibles, please turn to Luke 24, verses 1 through 12. In verse 1, but on the first day of the week at early dawn, they came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared. When what Luke, who Luke is talking about is Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and unnamed women that were with him because the Egyptians, they fully embalmed a body. They went through, they did the salt process, they took out the organs to, with the excess fluid and to preserve the body. Jews anointed the body with perfume to mask the odor of decomposition. And usually the embalming starts taking place like after the, soon after death, but Jesus died right before the Sabbath. So that had to be delayed until Sunday morning. And after that time, the decomposition, it would really start to smell. So these women, the willingness of these women to come out with this anointing was a sign of great devotion. Jesus had many followers beyond the disciples. There are only some that were mentioned, and among those were women, which was unusual among religious leaders of the time. There were several females mentioned throughout the Gospels. And all four Gospels tell us about these women coming to the tomb of Jesus on the first day of the week, which in the Jewish calendar would be Sunday, and finding the stone rolled away. That's really special in a couple of ways. Anyone that's looked through the Gospels you have to realize these are four really different people that wrote these, that they had uh, all different backgrounds and perspectives on the life and ministry of Jesus. So they didn't agree at all points. Some, like maybe John may concentrate on this, or Matthew may look at this, and it's based on their background. Kind of like if you had four guys that watched a movie and they gave a review, all four of the reviews would be different based on what they held important with the movie. All four of them, the writers of the Gospels, knew this event was special. They all mentioned women as the first people to discover Jesus had risen, had risen. And that in itself was special. 
first century Palestine, women were not held as regular citizens. If they had been trying to convince people and make up a story, they probably would have mentioned men in place of the women. <coughs> That's another thing that made Jesus so special. He didn't care what the world thought. He didn't care what the rules were. Luke didn't write it, but these women had to be broken from the weight of what they had seen and what they were about to see. Joseph 1942 described the location of the tomb Jesus was in. It was a borrowed tomb from Joseph of Arimathea, and it was right beside the place where Jesus had been crucified. So they had to go back to the scene of the scene of his death. <coughs> I could imagine him walking silently through that morning, saying very little. With your tears and your memories flowing freely as they approach this place of death. This source of light in their dark worlds had been extinguished, laying motionless in the tomb behind the cold, uh, cold stone wall. <coughs> I think most of us can sympathize with these ladies. We've all had to deal with losses. Not loss of what was, also the loss of what could have been. I think sometimes that hurts as badly or worse than what we actually experienced, the thought about what could have been. Jesus was revolutionary in his time. Physical, mental illness, addiction, loss of loved ones. They're all changes. They're all losses in our lives. We cried the bitter tears that these ladies have cried. But on this particular Sunday, bitter was about to become beautiful. Verses 2 and 3, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. This tomb was carved out of solid rock. <coughs> Sorry, y'all. Spring in South Carolina, a pile on the flows. And the arrangement, the way this was made, it would have big. It would have been a big, solid stone, like a round stone, and there would have been tracks, and it could have been pushed in place and pushed out of place. But not as, as easy as it sounds. These stones weigh between one to two tons. Two men could have put it into place, but once it's locked into place, it's a lot harder to get out. You would have had to have had several men. And Luke doesn't record exactly what they thought or what they said. But I'm pretty sure they didn't think this was a good thing. If you've been through a ton of bad things, if you've been through all this loss, loss after loss and trial after trial, and something happens, do you think it's an improvement or are you wondering what's next? What is next? Once the women saw the stone rolled away and the tomb emptied, their immediate reaction, they were head scratching. <laughs> they didn't expect to find the empty tomb. And I think the reaction shows that the resurrection accounts can't be wistful thinking. Even his own followers have forgotten what he had said. They probably thought the body had been stolen in order to be desecrated even farther. The remains of this person they loved and adored, gone. More pain heaped on top of them. They didn't want to get their hopes up. That could be any more than another disappointment. The world was giving them a sign, every sign that this was just another piece of the terrible end of Jesus of Nazareth. God was about to have a mic drop moment of hope in this time of hopelessness. Verses four through eight, while they were perplexed about this, behold, two men suddenly stood near them in gleaming clothing. And as the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, why are you seeking the living one among the dead? He is not here, 
but he is risen. Remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee, <coughs> saying that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinful men and be crucified, and on the third day rose from the dead. Then they remembered. And I think that we're like that sometimes. We know God's promises, but in our tragedies, it's easy to lose sight of them. I think it's also really ironic. Angels announced Jesus' birth. They also announced the resurrection of Jesus. I think it's important to note the similarities. Both times these angels didn't appear at the temple. They didn't appear to the top of Jewish society. They showed themselves to people that were considered the fringe of society. Second class citizens, people too unclean even to come into a temple. These angels announced new life in the birth and resurrection of Jesus and hope for all of us. And the angels seemed almost surprised that the women were surprised. You don't remember? The angels had heard what Jesus said regarding his resurrection, and they knew the women had heard it also. And they wondered, why are you surprised? You heard what he said. Six chapters before these verses, Jesus had said in Luke 18, verses 31 through 33, what he would have to go through. But in their tragedy, in their grief, they had forgotten Jesus' promises. I can relate. I think most of us can, and we've been in that time where our grief overcomes our knowledge. Our grief overcomes those promises. And we need a little reminding. And the angels ask a good question to the women in verse 5. The living are not found to be among the dead. In verse 6, he is not here. It's one of the most beautiful and important statements ever spoken by an angel to man. He's not here. Today you can look all over Jerusalem and you can find tomb after tomb, thousands of them, because that was the Jewish tradition at the time, to have above ground tombs, tombs cut into rock. Every so often, they'll claim that somebody has found the tomb of Jesus where his bones are at. The older I've gotten, the more I just have to smile, because they'll come out a little bit later and say, well, nah, we were wrong about that. They're wrong because his bones aren't there. Our Lord's risen. He has no, he only had need for a tomb for three days. I think today we're kind of like those ladies. A lot of us still search for Jesus in places of death, places where Jesus is far from. Religious traditionalism. Legalism, man's rules, the world. There are times where we can be in the church and be far away from Jesus. We can be talking with people, whether they're standing up here, whether they're deacons or whoever. Their lips worshiping, but their hearts are far away. It's still out there. We still experience what those ladies experienced. Because Jesus will be away from the spiritually dead that won't seek him. We find Jesus only where there's being resurrected life, where he's worshiped in spirit and in truth. First notes of hope were sounded in the hearts of the women when they remembered Jesus' words. That empty tomb did. Even the presence of the angels did. And the words of the angels couldn't change their hearts, but their memories of Jesus' words did. Hopeless to hopeful. An empty tomb couldn't. Angels of God couldn't. Words of Jesus. Hopeless to hopeful. 
verses 9 through 12. And they return from the tomb and report all these things to the 11, the 11 disciples, and to the rest. Now these women were Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and Mary, the mother of James. Also the other women with them were telling these things to the apostles. But these words appeared to them as nonsense, and they would not believe the women. Nevertheless, Peter got up and ran to the tomb. And when he stooped and looked in, he saw the linen wrappings only. And he went away to his home, marveling at what had happened. And it doesn't say this in this version, but in John, they write the linen wrappings, they weren't just wrapped up and just threw away. They were folded. They were neatly folded. And it goes back to Near Eastern hospitality at that time. When someone is totally finished with the meal, they would just walk, uh, ravel up the napkin and wad it up and throw it away. They fold it up. I'm returning. Another sign. Risen. And even a precursor to his second arrival. These women who were mentioned specifically and then their unnamed folks with them. They were given the privilege of being the very first to tell about the resurrection of Jesus. All four Gospels named these women and portrayed them as being the first people told about the resurrection of our Lord. Not the 11 disciples, not the Pharisees, not the scribes. Plain, ordinary, everyday people. These women saw evidence of the resurrected Jesus and they remembered his words that Jesus was alive and triumphed over death. Despite their assignment, they weren't believed. In fact, the medical, the Greek term for the way the disciples described it was basically the ramblings of a madman in the original translations. In the version of it, in John, John 20, Peter and John both ran to the tomb together. They saw the grave clothes, like I described, neatly folded. When John saw that, he believed. Peter didn't. He marveled at it, but he thought that someone that came in and grabbed the body. He didn't, he did not recognized he didn't understand what Jesus had been trying to tell him. <laughs> Peter analyzed it. He knew something was up, but he had forgotten the words that Jesus had told him. And he didn't understand and believe the way that John did. We can know that Jesus rose from the grave, but unless you know his words, it won't make sense. There's an element of what we believe that is faith. Jesus' words taken in faith. So many of us know the verses. So many of us know the story. But how many of us believe it? And how many of us understand what actually happened? Without knowing the life and the teachings of Jesus, you don't know what the resurrection means. There was the payment that Jesus offered on the cross, and it was perfect and complete for us. He paid a debt he didn't owe for people who owed a debt they couldn't pay. The cross was the payment and the empty tomb the receipt. Without knowing his life and his story, you can't know that death has no hold on a redeemed person. You don't know that when God's love and man's hate battled at the cross, God's love won. You don't know that because Jesus was raised from the dead, we can be resurrected in him. And today we celebrate Jesus' promises, his sacrifice, his resurrection.
Today we talked about the transition from bitter to beautiful, from hopeless to hopeful, from promise made to promise kept. The tomb didn't hold Jesus and it won't be our last stop either. And God continues to challenge the certainty of death with the promise of life. Let's stand and go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we read through your words, let your words be heard. Let your message, your intent be heard through what I've said. Father, it's your words, your message for us. Father, anyone that's listening to this, whether it's on Facebook, YouTube, in person, whatever it is, Father, let these words go to their hearts because we need to be reminded of the beauty and the specialty of this day, Father, in a world that tries to shut you out, in a world that tries to normalize and tries to explain the resurrection, that tries to make us believe it didn't happen, and we know it did. Father, all those years ago, those centuries ago, you walked out of that, Jesus, Lord Jesus walked out of that tomb. And we are still, still just so thankful because he is paying that debt that we cannot possibly pay. And Father, lead us. Lead us as we finish up this service, Father, to be your follower seven days a week. Not just one hour a week, but seven days a week. Help us to spread your message and using the gifts that you've given all of us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you. I hope you have a great Easter Sunday.